Jenny Sheets, thank you so much for spending time with us again. Here you are, back in Siena. Um, asked you to come kind of consult on some stuff as we were moving into our new hub space. Uh, but I said, Hey, yeah. can we chat, uh, again? So, um, if you are a longtime listener of reconstructing youth ministry, you know that Jenny was on with our first season talking about attachment, Jenny. Yes. We were just in New York and we had an attachment lesson right in front of us. Oh gosh. Okay. So if someone is listening for the first time, hopefully this can be educational. Uh, but you should for sure go back and listen to the first season episode with Jenny. We were in a park. Okay. And there was uh, lots of kids. So it was the first day in New York City that like the weather was like 60 mm-hmm. and they were like all going to the park at the park was slammed. And we went with our church that we were partnering with and we um, we took this uh, kind of big uh, f- um, it's like uh, four square. I don't know what it's called, um, but you put tiles in it at the top and then you have to you move this thing and they, f- they fall at the bottom. Well, there's this little boy. Um, I called him the like bruiser. connect for connect for thank yeah. you Yeah, not for did I say four square I don't uh-huh. know what I said yeah so four squares with that yeah um, so there's this little boy who like couldn't couldn't grasp the the kind of like this is how you get them and so he would just grab it and he would just shake it back and <laughs> forth right and that was his solution Solve the and so problem. one of our students saw that right one of our students saw that she said I'm just gonna kind of hold it still say hey buddy if we just do this and and just he every time he had a problem he went to a stranger to solve it. Mm, and I was mm-hmm. like, uh-oh, here we go. And uh, she, the, the student was like picking up on it. And I don't think she's done any you know, research or study on attachment. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw what I surmised was dad. And sure enough, that matched to be, that that's turned out to be true. Um, you know, scrolling, not, you know, not anti phones, but like he was like not mm-hmm. noticing that his kid was causing problems for other kids because as he was shaking this thing, there's other little toddlers that are like getting knocked over mm. and their parents <laughs> are kind of swooping in to fix mm-hmm. it. But then he would run to some, like a stranger to solve the problem. And then Jenny, this crazy thing happened. He started calling one of our teenagers, mommy. Oh gosh. And, and she was like, why he, she said, he's calling me mommy. And I'm like, Aww talk about this later you know (laughs) and so sure enough we talked about it and it was a eye-opening for her to Mm -hmm. see i said so you know and you know they can go back to the podcast and listen um but it's like he's probably not getting a ton of attention or problem solving or Mm -hmm. needs met uh at home Mm -hmm. and um yeah i have no idea i have no idea but you can see some of those signs so anyway it was um thank you for coming to share that with us because i don't know that i would have caught it uh you know otherwise so Anyway, Once you start learning like, about it, it shows up everywhere. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> true. It's true. And it's not just in kids, um, you know, but anyway, so, hey, I wanted to talk to you uh, and I want you to talk to our, our audience about safeguarding. Now, safeguarding, um, and you can probably define it better, um, <clears throat> is this, uh, I always say it's our child protection policy mm-hmm. um, and it's, it's the industry standard term, right? Mm-hmm. Like the safeguarding is what we do to protect uh, children, especially our most vulnerable population from mm-hmm. abuse. Mm-hmm. Um, you, when did you step into the role of safeguarding director? So I stepped in to the role in August of 2022. Wow. So, okay. So how did you get your start at Houston's first? Cause that was not your first role here. It was not. Okay. I've actually had quite a few roles. Okay. Um, in 2017, um, Doug Bischoff, who is our next generations mm-hmm. minister over at the loop campus, um, had an open position, um, for a next gen ministry assistant. And I was transitioning out of teaching and interviewed with Doug. Um, and that's how I got my start at okay. Houston's first. He took a chance on me and hired me. That's awesome. Um, and so I worked with Doug, um, attached to all of our next gen ministries mm-hmm. for about three years. That's um, right. Because you used to have to do the finances. I did for used like to do the reconciliation of that was all a nightmare, of right? it was a nightmare. Is that your favorite part of the job? It was probably my least favorite part. <laughs> to be honest. (laughs) Um, So I did have to reconcile the budgets for all of our camps and rush week and all of those fun things. (laughs) Um, But part of my, one of my, um, one of the things that I did as a part of that role was I was the person that processed um, in the past what we called the next gen application. So 
our policy and all of that was housed um, under our operations department. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was the person that read through all of the applications. Mm, It's the origin Uh, story. It is. So I think really I was just annoying, if I'm being honest. (laughs) I would read them and I would be like, okay, well, they said this. What do we do about that? That sounds concerning. Sure. Um, That doesn't sound... Not annoying. That sounds a little bit sketchy. Someone has to look at it. You know, they said that they're a teacher, but they listed no other previous experience with children. That sounds a bit odd as a Uh, teacher. Yeah. You typically have lots of other experience. Most teachers don't just show up in a classroom one day. <laughs> so um, really at that point, we just kind of um, processed applications and ran background checks. Okay. And um, there really wasn't a lot of um, making sure um, that everyone was doing exactly what we were saying we were doing in our policy. Yeah. Um, and so as a part of that role, I just kind of kept finding things and asking questions yeah. like, why do we do it this way? Yeah. Why don't we do that? Um, and uh, eventually, I, um, I've i always had a heart for missions. I served um, overseas um, in Kenya um, for a season with a children's home or orphanage for babies. Um, and as a result of that, got really connected with our Legacy 68.5 Adoption, Foster, and Orphan Care Ministry. And so I had been a longtime volunteer, um, had been learning and going to lots of training. Mm -hmm. Um, Trauma-competent caregiver Mm -hmm. um, was a training that I had done as a part of being a legacy volunteer. And Mm -hmm. I got trained to be an affiliate trainer and train other people. Um, Which has been phenomenal for our staff, at least. I know know, several volunteers have had the opportunity. Yeah. It's helpful. Um, and so there was a season where it just kind of felt like God was calling me to something, something different. Mm. Um, I loved my season in next gen. I loved working for Doug. I loved all that it entailed. Um, and yet it felt like God was, was shifting things. Mm. And, um, our legacy team had an opening for, um, an orphan and vulnerable care, um, associate position. Mm -hmm. Um, and because I had had previous experience on the field, Um, it was really my dream job if you looked at the job description. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I transitioned into that role, um, in the middle of COVID. Um, (laughs) so, um, when we were not doing any international travel, um, not doing much of anything, um, I transitioned into that role and oversaw all of our partnerships, Mm -hmm. Um, with ministries that serve orphan and vulnerable children. And okay. as a part of that role, um, we created a process, an application process for partners, um, kind of a screening process for partners, mm-hmm. um, and really with the goal of building deeper relationship with them mm-hmm. um, for our relationships not to be transactional. Like, you know, we talk to you once a year, we write right. you a big check, go on your merry way, mm-hmm. but to really be a church that um, supports, um, through care, through resourcing, through equipping, through, um, you know, providing, um, missionary care type things, counseling for, Mm -hmm. um, those on the field and helping them figure out some of the hard things that they're walking through. Mm -hmm. Um, and so as a part of that work, we really started, um, digging into what our partner ministries, um, were doing in regard to child protection. Mm. Um, and we know, um, kids that have already experienced trauma or harm because they're living residentially Mm. or have entered the foster care system or have come to us through adoption, um, they've already experienced some really difficult things. Mm. And so um, kind of the bar is a bit higher for making sure um, that they don't encounter harm in the way that we're caring for them outside Mm -hmm. of their biological family. Um, And so that really caused us to take a deep look um, at what some of our partners were doing, what we were supporting, and helping them raise the bar Mm -hmm. um, so that kids that had already experienced harm could come into spaces of safety Mm -hmm. um, and actually begin the work of healing, Mm -hmm. Um, come into a place where um, the staff and the caregivers taking care of them were safe people um and that they could um just relax Mm -hmm. and let god heal um through equipping and support and all kinds of things but a lot of that is you know the first rule is do no harm yeah um and as we continued to talk about that um we just kept reflecting on whether or not we were holding our partners to a higher standard than what we were actually doing ourselves Mm -hmm. um it brought up a lot of really big questions Mm -hmm. and 
thankfully, we've been a church that has had a policy and has cared about this for a long time. It wasn't a new idea right. for us. Um, we've had a policy since John Bassanio was our pastor. Okay. Um, and then Barry Walchek and Doug Bischoff um, took it many steps further mm-hmm. um, during the season um, that they oversaw that. And then I want to say it was in 2021. We had this um, provision in our policy that we had to review our mm-hmm. policy and our screening process um, every couple of years. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they formed kind of like a task force Mm -hmm. of, um, people that had been a part of the process, people who had buy-in in in the areas of next gen and volunteers and children, um, our legacy team, um, our counseling team, just for some added wisdom. Mm -hmm. Um, and we made some adjustments and some modifications, um, really just to make sure that we were doing what we were already saying that we were doing in our policy. Um, And out of that came a lot of discussions that it's really hard to enforce something when no one is the singular person in charge of it. Um, And so that brought forth an effort um, to really have a focused effort, Mm -hmm. to have a point person that Mm -hmm. was in charge. Um, And for a season, you know, change is hard. It takes a long time. And um, in... Um, July of 2021, I was um, on a training trip to Kenya um, in Uganda, um, helping to raise up Kenyan and Ugandan trainers for trauma competent caregiver and ended up with COVID, which was not (laughs) not what I thought God had planned for that trip and got stuck in a you know, hotel for a week sitting by myself and had an opportunity to do nothing but rest. Um, but it was definitely God's provision because when I came home, um, they offered me, um, the position to, um, direct, um, what was then called our CISNA team, children, youth, and special needs adults. Um, and so while I was in Kenya, um, Dr. Trammell, along with several other, um, leadership team members decided, um, that they really wanted to, um, take a step forward and create a team a department, Mm -hmm. um, a staff that was um, solely focused on making sure that as a church, we were leading well in that Mm -hmm. area. So good, man. So you, you obviously had the pedigree between teaching and working with orphans and, and the vulnerable population and um, coming, you know, reading all these next gen apps Mm -hmm. and like, this is something you've been doing for Mm -hmm. a very long time. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're able to put, put that into practice. I I know that we're thankful for it. I know that, um, it was all, it was abrupt. I remember it was like, we've, we're going from, they do an application and a background check, which, you know, you guys have trained us the background check. Let's see if I can remember the, the, the stat. It doesn't catch 90% Mm -hmm. because they just, they have, they're not in the system yet. Mm -hmm. And so the background check is a necessary part, Mm -hmm. but it, it, but it's, it can't be your only fail safe. Um, and so, you know, our church, you know, realized that, you know, we needed to beef it up. And so I remember some of those first meetings and I'm sure you got your fair share of grief on like, this is, (laughs) this is really heavy. I mean, we've had to do some things staffing wise to make Mm -hmm. sure that we come up to a certain degree. And I know Mm -hmm. that we're probably not done making changes and, um, but I I will say I'm very thankful for, um, you and our safeguarding department and our policies because the, the, the entire reason for this podcast is addressing why young people are walking away from the church. And mm. I've, I've, I've uh, just, my own thoughts is that one of the things that I think students are, are seeing is, um, you know, maybe, uh, pastors leading double lives, mm-hmm. um, experiencing abuse in the church mm-hmm. and seeing it even covered up mm-hmm. and seeing, um, you know, kind of the, 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 the quote unquote good guys, Mm-hmm. Um, not be so good. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we want to address this. We mm-hmm. want to, we want, and every parent wants a safe place for their kids. Absolutely. Um, and so this conversation really impacts, um, parents who mm-hmm. are bringing their kids to church, um, uh, volunteers who are trying to si- sign up to serve in these mm-hmm. next gen areas. And when we say next gen, we really mean like birth through, you know, 18 birth through high school graduation, maybe even college. Um, but also church leaders. Mm-hmm. I want to talk to those kind of three different groups of people. Uh, now our volunteers have, have gone through this process and, mm-hmm. and are well versed in it. Uh, I think our parents are still probably asking some questions that they, mm-hmm. they like the idea that, uh, we are, you know, quote unquote, keeping our kids safe, but maybe they don't know to, to the extent, you know, mm-hmm. that we do it. Yeah. 
I also want to point church leaders in the right direction. Yeah. Um, and so uh, my big question is like, who are you learning from? Mm. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to say like, well, I've got some ideas, but mm -hmm. you know, are there some churches and organizations that are doing it well or that are providing this information or kind of who, who are you learning from in this area? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I would say on a local level, um, one of the things that we established when we started the safeguarding team um, was a safeguarding advisory committee. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a team of professionals, um, those that um, have more knowledge and expertise um, that I meet with on a regular basis mm -hmm. when we have um, situations or questions where we're like, oh, that's a new one. What do we do with that? <laughs> um, there are people that can provide wisdom and expertise. Um, one person in particular um, that has been just a great resource for us as a church over many years, um, but especially um, in this realm, is Lisa Burgoyne. Um, mm -hmm. She is a church member. Um, her um, son grew up in our hub ministry um, at the Loop, and she's the program director for the Children's Assessment Center of Harris County. Mm. So each um, county in Texas, um, nationally actually, has a um, an advocacy center or an assessment center where the majority of child sexual abuse cases are mm. processed through. And Harris County actually has the largest one. Um, so she oversees wow. all programming um, for the Harris County Children's Assessment Center. Mm. Um, so it's a partnership between, um, it's half nonprofit, half government agency. Um, all of the local law enforcement sex crimes units office there. Um, so they have a great amount of collaboration. Wow. So for families and for children that have experienced something terrible, um, they get a lot of resources, support, um, and collaboration mm. um, to walk those families through that process um, in the easiest way possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so she's obviously an expert um, in that particular um, form of difficult experience. Mm -hmm. And so she's a great person that we've been learning from. Um, additionally, um, I have been trained as a darkness to light facilitator. Mm. So darkness to light is, um, a program that, um, helps people, um, understand the risk of child sexual abuse, um, what to do about it, mm -hmm. how as a bystander or just a person, um, we can step in and make a difference and help prevent it and what to do to respond, um, appropriately. Um, if we discover or encounter, um, something inappropriate that's happening, mm -hmm. um, they do a lot of research. And so um, when it comes to understanding um, recent statistics or trends, um, they're a really great resource. Yeah. Um, and then additionally, on the front of how do you do this well as an organization or a church or a ministry, um, Ministry Safe has been a really great resource mm. for us. They have um, a training um, that we've been utilizing for all staff and volunteers um, just to help everyone understand um, how to prevent child sexual abuse. Mm. Um, but they have additional forms of training that we've utilized as staff mm -hmm. um, about how to screen appropriately. Um, and we've actually um, gone through an assessment or an audit with them of our policy, mm -hmm. our implementation, our practices, our screening, how to handle uh, navigate situations. And that has been a really great resource mm -hmm. um, to understand legally what we have available to us as a church, what we can and can't do, what we should be doing, um, and how we can further strengthen the work that we're already doing. Yeah. So that's been a really great resource as well. That's good. Um, and, they, and they're they're informing us on the like particular specific practical things that we need to add mm -hmm. and take away. And yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the great thing about working with them is they have tailored everything. They've taken a look at our at our actual facilities. They've taken a look at our programs. They have interviewed our staff. Mm -hmm. um, and so their recommendations are really tailored to who we are as a church. Mm -hmm. um, there's some of them, you know, that are kind of broad, like this is what churches in Texas do. Mm -hmm. This is a wise thing to do. Um, and then there's some of them that are very specific to our particular context mm -hmm. in our particular situation. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's been really helpful for me personally. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, what, um, what are you seeing that's encouraging? I know that the, so, you know, I was even thinking about that name that, uh, the County, the child 
what is it called again? Uh, the Children's Assessment Center. Children's Assessment Center. So if they're going to go, if, if, if someone is listening and they live in Wyoming, mm-hmm. I mean, they, they're going to have to talk to their county mm-hmm. leadership, mm-hmm. essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, but Ministry Safe and Darkness to Light is something that they mm-hmm. can Absolutely. They can they're both to. national organizations. What are you, what are you seeing? I mean, because you're, you're, it's not a fun topic no, necessarily. <laughs> you live. And so obviously we need to pray for you and, um, and, and all that. But, uh, what do you see that's encouraging mm. in the conversation? Maybe in our church, um, you know, the, maybe the, the way we've beefed up or, or mm-hmm. you know, what do you see that's encouraging in this conversation? Yeah, I think, um, as we've brought new volunteers and new staff on, um, I've been really encouraged by a lot of our newer, um, people that we have gone through the screening process. Many people have reached out and mm-hmm. just thanked us, yeah. um, as a church in general mm-hmm. for taking it seriously, um, for doing, um, everything that we can to ensure that the church is a place where the kids that we're serving, um, the youth that we're serving mm-hmm. and even the special needs adults that we're serving, mm-hmm. um, Um, that they get to come and experience the gospel. They get to come and experience truth and love and a safe space. Mm -hmm. Um, Hopefully without anything else uh, mingled in with that, Mm -hmm. that um, would be a block to the gospel taking root and going forward in their lives. Um, And then I think we've also seen um, a lot of people where that protection didn't happen for them as children. Um, It's definitely a hard topic to talk about. Um, and because we've had this added emphasis on it, we've talked about it quite a lot. Um, and so for them, it can be a really challenging conversation, a really challenging thing to bring up all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think I've heard a lot of feedback, um, from those that have something in their own story, Mm -hmm. just, um, that it makes them feel cared for and supported mm-hmm. um, when we do it with delicacy yeah. um, or when we do it gently um, so that um, they know that hopefully um, the things that they might have experienced um, aren't going to happen on our watch, yeah. we hope. Yeah, that's good. Um, or if they, or if they unfortunately do, mm-hmm. um, that we're going to take it seriously, mm-hmm. um, that we're not going to sweep it under the rug, that we're going to do um, what's necessary and sometimes really hard, Mm -hmm. um, to make sure that kids get, um, the help that they need and the care that they need if they're, um, in a situation that is really difficult. Well, that's good. I mean, I, I'm, I am a student minister who has to obviously keep our student ministry safe uh, Mm -hmm. and secure for students, but I'm also a dad Mm -hmm. and I've got three of my own kids that are in our ministries and, Mm -hmm. you know, and it comes from, from regular church attendance to camps and retreats to, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so I, I, you know, obviously have stake in this conversation. I'm Mm -hmm. so thankful, um, that we're doing this. Um, what can you, I want to talk to church leaders for a minute. Like Mm -hmm. maybe there's a church leader out there that's like, man, we're doing the application. We're doing the back. We thought the background check was enough. Mm -hmm. Um, can you just kind of line out some of the steps that we Mm -hmm. ask of each volunteer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, let me just speak to the background check for a for a bit. Sure. Um, so it's definitely a wise idea to do a background check. Mm-hmm. You don't want to skip that step. Right. Um, but research shows that less than 10% of people um, who have the desire to harm children in whatever way actually have something to find on their background check mm-hmm. or have ever encountered the justice system. Mm-hmm. Um, And so that means 90% of the people um, who are trying to gain access to kids for um, inappropriate purposes have nothing on their background check to find. And that is scary. scary. Um, And so we need to do the background check. It gives us good information um, when there's something to find, Mm -hmm. Um, but it doesn't give us everything that we Mm -hmm. need to know. And so um, most resources that you can find, there's a couple of books that we've read as a team too that have been really helpful. There's a church and ministry guide um, to child protection. And then there's a book called On Guard by mm. Deepak Reju. He's a pastor. Um, and almost all resources that you find will list these same steps. Um, they are the same ones that are recommended. Good to know. Um, so having um, those that you give access to kids, um, being a church member, if your church does that, mm-hmm. um, or, um, a committed person in your, in your church body, mm-hmm. um, and then a six month minimum, um, of involvement. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes they recommend a year, um, ours is six months. Mm-hmm. Um, so a person has to have been, um, actively involved in our church body for at least six months. Um, and that gives us the opportunity to get to know them a mm-hmm. little bit. We never really know anyone fully, but mm-hmm. in six months, if there's something, um, 
you know, really odd or something that really stands out about that person's character, um, you might, you know, that gives you an opportunity to kind of have a feel for that person mm-hmm. and whether or not, you know, some people are, you're like, yeah, no, I, I would not allow them mm-hmm. to take care of my own child. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then we have an application process, um, that asks, um, targeted questions, um, about a person's background, their previous experience with kids, um, or youth, um, and then um, just kind of about their um, walk with the Lord. Mm-hmm. We want to make sure that the people that are coming to teach our kids and model what it looks like to follow Jesus mm-hmm. are actually doing that. Yeah. Um, more is caught than taught. And so mm-hmm. we often like to think it's what I'm going to say that is the biggest difference. And really, it's it's how we act. Mm-hmm. Um, so we want to make sure those people are aligned um, in what we believe. Um, and then... After that, we check references. So Mm -hmm. we check at least three references for every volunteer. Um, We do more than that for staff who have previous experience with kids. Um, And then we interview everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, So that is either in person or on a video um, so that we can get a feel for that person. Um, And then... Um, we make a decision based on the information that we have um, available to us. If we need to, we mm-hmm. ask more questions. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes that requires some really hard decisions and yeah. some really hard conversations. Yeah. Um, it's been a great opportunity. I say opportunity. It's been a hard opportunity, <laughs> but often yeah. um, areas of sin and suffering that people have not yet dealt with in their yeah. personal lives yeah. come up in those conversations. Sure. Um, and it's definitely an opportunity for some discipleship, mm-hmm. um, for some exhortation towards um, the things that God calls us to um, as believers. So yeah, that's good. Well, I, I think that too. If if there's church leaders listening and they're and they're realizing that you know they need to beef up their their child protection, um, that there's been plenty of resources um, given. And uh, but my my one last question is. What are some of the common misconceptions about mm-hmm. safeguarding? Mm-hmm. What are, what do you think churches might be assuming? Mm-hmm. Parents might be assuming um, that maybe they should challenge that that assumption. Yeah, I think um, I would say for parents, um, what I observe the most is that we generally naturally assume that the church is a safe place, and yeah. we definitely want to be the safest right. place possible. Right. Um, but unfortunately, both parents and church leaders need to understand, like, there's real evil in the world, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are people that know um, that because churches um, believe in grace and mm-hmm. redemption mm-hmm. and restoration, um, we tend to take people's word at face value. Yeah. And that can be a really good thing. Yeah. But it can also be a place where those that have bad intentions mm-hmm. are aware of and take advantage of. Yeah. Um, and so I would say, even if you're doing a great job of safeguarding, we can't get so comfortable right. um, that we um, just assume, mm-hmm. um, one, that the people that have access to our kids um, are safe. And there's this tension between... Um, fear and protection, sure. right? Fear and restoration. And mm-hmm. so definitely don't want to end up all the way on one end or the other, mm-hmm. um, but kind of this both and. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to keep my eyes open. I'm going to use the discernment and the wisdom that God has given me um, to keep my own kids safe, even in a place where yeah. um, the church is taking a lot of steps yeah. um, to be as safe as possible. Yeah. Um, but churches are open to anyone, right? Mm -hmm. That is the beautiful part of the gospel Mm -hmm. is that anyone can come Mm -hmm. and they do. And that's great. Um, and I really do mean anyone as the person who processes background checks (laughs) for the church, right? There are lots of people, um, who, you know, have things in their past. Um, and it's beautiful that they are a part of the church. Um, but we want to make sure that there's genuine conversion and genuine, um, walking with the Lord, um, and that those people really should be trusted with yeah. access to our kids before yeah. um, we give that to them. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, Jenny, thank you so much for spending some time. I really hope that um, this conversation gives uh, some of our parents and volunteers mm-hmm. a little bit of insight into kind of the inner workings of why we do what we do and that they can hopefully have a little more like comfort when they mm-hmm. drop their kids mm-hmm. off and that, that our eyes are wide open um, mm-hmm. to 
um, obviously the evil in the world, but we want to protect, we want to mm-hmm. protect these children. Um, but also if church leaders are out there and they're just saying like, golly, this is a, this is a conversation we're not having, mm-hmm. um, that they, you've given so many good resources. And so thank mm-hmm. you for doing that. Thank you for doing what you do. Uh, yeah. Jenny, you have uh, a very difficult job It is, and, <laughs> um, and so we're thankful for you thanks. and thanks for holding us, uh, holding our feet to the fire and keeping our kids safe. You're welcome. Can I add one more thing for parents? Yeah, please. Yeah. So I think the other thing, um, that we have really, um, seen as beneficial, Um, and I think this is probably something you guys talk about in youth ministry as well. Um, when we have a healthy theology of sexuality or understanding of God's design for Mm -hmm. sex and the way that he created our bodies, it's really helpful. Mm -hmm. And so as parents, the more you can have conversations about those topics, even though they're uncomfortable, the more you can teach your young kids, the anatomically correct words for their body parts, um, the more you can prepare them to be in a world that is fallen. Yeah. Um, and to have words and language and voice um, to, one, express to you um, when something weird happens to them or um, when they hear something at school or mm-hmm. at church mm-hmm. that is is not what you want them to believe about the way that God designed these yeah. things. Um, so the more you can have those uncomfortable conversations That's as good. a parent um, – the better. Yeah. Um, and we've got lots of resources. Mark has lots of resources for that. We did that. Um, we did that episode a couple yeah. months ago, actually. Yep. Um, I, I, just, I picked up Julia Sadusky's book, um, uh, start the start talking to your kid about mm-hmm. sex. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and the thing that blew my mind and I heard the stat, but I, I kind of was reminded that the number one guard against child sex abuse is to name Mm -hmm. the genitalia Mm -hmm. specifically technically Mm -hmm. from zero to two to start at that age um and that's really impacting some of my thought towards our parents and the resourcing that we're doing with student Mm -hmm. student ministry age stuff Mm -hmm. is i i need to be talking to our preschool Mm -hmm. (laughs) moms of preschoolers and saying hey we got some work to do if you want your teenage years to be healthier um so so very good it's a hard conversation but an important one so very important you're right We'll say thank you so much for being here and taking the time with us.